sure that I changed my slides yesterday. But as you're thinking about this stuff, and as you saw for an X in life code, what I really want to do over the next 12 minutes is talk about a big X and then a little X. And the big X, sometimes it looks like this, right? First point contact transistor. And as you're asking yourself, okay, what does this little device solve or change? Or maybe a better question on this is, what didn't this solve or change? So as you're thinking of solving for X with a transistor, you might ask the same question with this particular diagram, right? So first note on the internet, Robert's drawing. And again, ask yourself, what did this solve if you were solving for X? And of course, that also asks, what didn't it solve? So some of these things are just so small and turn into something so big that it gets really interesting. And it becomes really difficult to answer the question, how do you solve for X in this stuff? And that means that a few discoveries become so large that they solve not for one X, but for multiple Xs. And that's what makes this area so interesting, right? The argument I'm going to make is that when you take a diagram like this and you begin to talk about synthetic biology, it actually becomes something that looks like this. The overlap, the Venn diagram, just becomes huge and really unintended consequences as you go forward. So in this context, let's take a look at this little creature, right? So this is the world's first fully programmable cell. And some people thought that was a reasonably big deal. In fact, some people thought that was a science discovery of the year. And that came out of a discussion in a bar, Landini Brothers in Virginia, and about the fourth scotch, Craig Venter, Ham Smith, Dave Kieran, and I said, wouldn't it be really cool if we could program a cell from scratch, much as you program a chip on a computer? And four years and 30 million bucks later, that little baby's born. And then the question becomes, okay, so how'd you make this thing? And basically, you, you take four jars of chemicals and you have these little robot arms, and then they assemble like Lego blocks, 100, piece, 100 mega, uh, nucleotide base pair pieces, and then you start playing March Madness, right? So you just take this bracket, and you tie it to this bracket, and you tie it to this bracket, and you go from 1,000 base pair cassettes to 10,000 to 100,000 to a million, and you get the world's largest organic molecule. And then all you have to do is you have to come up with a technology so it doesn't break when you manipulate it, then a technology to put it into a cell, and then a technology for the cell to boot it. But other than that, it was easy. Here's the impact of this stuff, right? And what's really interesting is you're getting high school kids and college kids thinking about how do you begin to assemble simple, standard, interchangeable parts in loving cells. And if you can do that, that is a big deal. So as you're thinking about the consequences of that, you're beginning to get these early menus, and you're beginning to get, you know, off-the-shelf parts, call it a radio shack for biology, where you can get cell death or conjugation or motility or odor production or sensing. And you're, you're simply going into the little radio shack and saying, I want some of this, and I want some of this, and I want some of this, and I want to plug it in. And really what it means is that biology is just about the stage where we all started playing with things that look like this. Right? So that's about where we are in synthetic biology and cell growth. So you can make the light, you can make you know, the buzzer, you can make this, you can make that, et cetera. It's not really sophisticated, you're not at the computer, you don't have the Intel chip yet, but boy do these systems move fast once they start to solve for X. And as you're thinking of the consequences of this stuff, here's 2007, and by 2007 at iGEM, you're already beginning to have this Venn diagram overlap between electronics and biology. So you're beginning to build, you know, divide by two circuits and switches and print laser construction and wave patterns, you know, all the stuff that you used to do in Tripoli. Now, the interesting thing in the system is, here's an article that was published in October 2011, and basically you're beginning to be able to do these things and construct these things on a predictable basis. And again, that's a big deal. Right? Because if you move from one-offs to predictable, simple systems that are modular, then you can begin to really think about building these fabs in an interesting way. You can take very simple components, like this Tokyo Tech iGEM project, and say, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to engineer cells so they basically oxygenate. We're going to do it so they don't freeze. We're going to do them so they don't sunburn. And that's not terribly complicated. Okay, in genetic engineering terms, people kind of went, yeah, so what? Except that if you do that and you put it in a rocket and you shoot it at the Martian ice caps, 
it lands on the ice caps, it begins to create an oxygen atmosphere, and what they want to do is they want to terraform the planet. Just mildly ambitious, right? And as you're thinking about these components, there's two really big differences between what's going on in digital code and what's going on in life code. The first thing is these systems were moving in parallel for years. So you've got Moore's Law up there in white. You've got cost of base pairs or the cost of genome or the base pairs generated, whatever measure you want. And they're moving along and they're happy and they're toying with each other. And then something happened in the summer of 2007. And this thing just dropped off a cliff. Right? Really different system, really big divergence. Let me give you an order of magnitude of this divergence. So cost of sequencing a gene goes from about nine million bucks to $10,000. Okay, that's a drop of 800 times. Let's just put that in digital terms. Computer costs over the same period fell by four. So what's the impact of this stuff? We're now generating life code about three times faster than we can build computers to store it or build pips, pipes to ship it. And there's gonna be a crossover point here where there's gonna be some very, very large companies because we haven't had to ask and answer the question, can we build fast enough to store it or transport it or triage it? And that digital world, that life science world is gonna be a really interesting intersection. Here's a second big difference. No matter how you program a computer, you will not have a thousand computers when you come down in the morning. It is a big deal to have software make its own hardware. It means the system scales at a different speed. And that's what makes the system so interesting, right? It's programmable, standardizable, it's moving a hell of a lot faster than the digital revolution, and it scales fast. So you can go to a little startup like ExxonMobil and say, what would you like me to program? Well, for some reason they chose fuels. Imagine that. So we started programming in San Diego, algae to make fuels. And then we started scaling, and this is what our little greenhouse looks like. And now we want to become modest little farmers. We want to build a farm that eventually looks like this. Now the interesting thing is if you can program a cell on a simple standardizable basis, well, you can make fuels, or you can make textiles, or you can make petrochemical derivatives, or you can go out to Novartis and make a vaccine and take care of the problems of contagion in about two weeks, manufacturing a vaccine for everyone in the United States from sequence. And as you think of the consequences of this stuff, how we make stuff, where we make stuff, is gonna absolutely fundamentally change to the point where DuPont today is getting 40% of its earnings from life science products. This is not just little startups in the People's Republic of Cambridge. So here, that's the big X. Let's talk for one second about a second smaller X, which is traffic jams. Back in the 80s when the Beltway used to move, there was this one place where the Beltway backed up every single day. It drove the traffic engineers absolutely crazy. Why in the hell is it backing up right here? And they looked and they studied and everything else, and then they got a letter that said there's this one idiot who gets on same time, same place, left lane 55, every day. Letter gets sent to the Washington Post. Two days later, another letter appears. Hi, my name's John Nestor. I'm the person who does that. It's easier for me to drive on the left. I don't have to change. And the law says 55. Anybody else wants to speed, that's their problem, not mine. That's so outraged people that you had a verve in Washington called Nestoring. Guess where John Nestor worked? He was in charge of renal and cardiac drugs. And the letter said, drug has to be safer, it can't get approved. It wasn't approved. It turns out that John Nestor had an unassailable record of protecting the public from harmful drugs. Among other things, because over a couple of decades, he never approved a single drug. <laughs> and it turns out he may have killed a lot of people because of that. And as you think about the consequences of that, that is medicine's missing measurement. Because we think about, boy, this might harm somebody, but you know, there's something on the other side. Here's what's happened to new drugs that you get per billion dollars spent. That's your little trend line. 
1950 to 2010, huge technology advance, huge databases, combinatorial chemistry, all this stuff. And your output is just dropping through the floor. Here's an order of magnitude. This is like Moore's law in reverse. Okay? And by the way, this little x has a few consequences because not only does it hurt personalized medicine, not only does it hurt rolling out a lot of the stuff that we've heard and will hear in this conference, but it may break the United States. Because if there's one area that is absolutely driving the deficit batshit, it's healthcare and life science and regulatory costs. And as you're thinking about this stuff, what it's done is it shifted pharma's focus from discovery to mar mergers and marketing to the point where pharma's now spending about twice as much on these ads that you see on the Super Bowl as it is on R&D. And that's a real problem, because it makes science moot, right? And as you're thinking about these systems, when a drug can jump at 100 million bucks, you get drugs for malaria, you get drugs for TB, you get drugs for this, you get drugs for that. You start playing Olympic at 300 million by 87, a bunch of drugs don't come to market. Forget about approval, they simply don't get tested. And today, at about a billion three, not a lot of people make that. And we kill a lot of people because those drugs don't get investigated, because they don't come to market, but we don't measure that stuff. Of course, some drugs do make the hurdle right, occasionally. <laughs> but they're fewer and fewer. And it doesn't work with personalized medicine. Here's a really interesting idea, right? There is not a single instance of a congressional committee asking why something was not done or approved. So, guess what message all these folks are getting? Guess what happens if you don't measure? Guess what happens if you have missing measurements as your system, the digital system, begins to collide with the life science system and you try and produce stuff? So maybe the question we should be asking is at some point, by acting, by not acting, by being too careful, by making it too expensive, maybe we're killing more people than the regulations are saving. And we may be doing that by an order or two of magnitude. There's got to be a crossover point here, right? I mean, I'm not saying eliminate all government. I'm not saying eliminate all regulators. I'm simply saying measure the cost of not acting. And as you're doing that, you ask, what's the crossover point? We don't know. We have no idea because we don't measure that stuff. So, here's my moonshot, small one. I want all of you to crowdsource medicine's missing measurement. What I want you to do is I want you to understand and help me understand and measure the risk of acting and not acting. And very specifically, let's explicitly measure what is the cost of not acting, of not creating a medicine, of taking 12 years instead of four to bring a medicine to market, in deaths, in disability, life years, et cetera. And let's explicitly measure the cost of acting slowly so that there is a pressure on university IRBs. Oh my God, I'm gonna be embarrassed. Let's take another year. You're gonna kill 4,000 people or 5,000 people if you take another year. Let's just make that explicit as you measure your reputation. Here's my desire. Let's use all you math geniuses out there and let's use everybody in the world to begin to create a relatively simple Black-Scholes-like equation that begins to measure for technology, and let's start with pharma, but for other technologies, the risk, reward, and regulatory costs, and put them on one sheet so that when, a when something comes in before Congress, there's a pressure on the other side to act. Thank you very much. Let us define X. X is a solution a solution to a seemingly insurmountable problem, like climate change or cancer, one that affects the world. But what if we redefine X as a challenge, an opportunity for radical thinking, a chance to light up the world with breakthrough ideas and cutting edge technology, the stuff of science fiction that just might fly after all. Solving for X requires wonder and imagination and the vision to build seemingly impossible solutions to the world's biggest problems. Solve for X. Moonshot thinking.